Ek doe nie archeologie, ja, maar eigenlijk is ek meer wat ek sal doen met menselijke gedrag as ekoloog. Um, dit gaan nou een navolsing van goed wat vandag nog bestaan. Die veld, die interactie van mense vandag nog met die veld, en specifiek die natuurlijke hulpgrond ekonomie wat bestaan um, in die veld met mense wat as jachte versamelaars, ethnografies, hier die hulpgrond is al benut. Dit is eindelijk waar ek vir vandag gaat, maar ek sien ook as een paar baie bekende gezicht, die hele kruis, hulle my nie, um, John, weet, ek seker een paar mense het, my, die skromp mense hier wat ek ken, so daar is komponente wat herhaling sal wees, uh, maar ek wil die story vertel, van as jy die ekologie in die suidkap het, wat op zichzelf functioneer, jy moet die mens ingooi, want die mens is al deel van die ekosysteem van een baie lang tijd, um, ons sien het in die archeologie en dit is een baie oude geschiedenis en is een baie interessante story wat ons kan neem in die toekomst in waar die mense deel was van die ekosysteem en nie die meesters daarvan nie. So ons kan baie inspiratie trek uit die story wat ons hier het in die Suidkap so erfenis. So kom ons spring weg. Um, ek wil begin met, I'm going to start with archaeology, just to give you some background of the story of cognitive development of our species, only us, um, in the Southern Cape, and then how people hypothesize, throwing out theories, how the coast, coastal adaptation, played a role in the cognitive development of our species in the Southern Cape. Um, we see in these archaeological sites, there's a lot of shellfish that's preserved well, but no one really knew what the relationship economically is or was between humans and the coast. So in other words, how productive is the coast for human, against human predation? Um, secondly, it can be productive, but you go a second time and there's nothing left. So how resilient is the coast to human predation? ongoing human predation over time. Um, and then, once we've seen those results, I quickly want to just discuss the, the various ecological drivers that play a role into this productivity and resilient, resilience of our intertidal zone, and then obviously the nearshore subtidal, which we call the nearshore marine ecology. Um, but then, apart from talking about um, coastal intertidal resources, er staat ook ander goed wat hier plaasvind in die Suidkap landelijk, byvoorbeeld, nie in die see nie. Ek wil net vinnig daar ook praat. Daar is ook goed wat in die verlede gebeur het, landskappe wat ontbloot is, enzovoorts. Daar is ander goed wat ook aan die gang is, nie in die skulpkost wat hier het. En dan laatste wat ek wil praat oor, wat hierdie resultate wat ek gaan lewe, gaan my eindelijk net in die Suidkap, wat ek lang terug te doen het. Uh, maar ek is intussen al geruime tyd bezig op ander plekke, in die Oostkap en in die Noordkap. En specifiek, ek het nou in die Noordkap begin in die Diamantveld, uh, Namakwa, Noord Namakwa. Uh, sê maar so, het is een klein sê en koning naas. Um, en die vraag van aride omgevings. Uh, want soos jy allemaal weet, nie veel gebeur in die kamp dit zou nie. Dit is jy uitdagings het, gebeur wat dit. En so ek, 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 ek is baie opgebord om die vergelijke tussen die suid en die noordgaan. Oké, okay. so ek gaan wegspring met die ding. Oké. Okay. So, met die archeologie. Um, we know that there's a consensus that modern humans and modern human behavior arose in Africa. This actually happened at Blombos Cave, uh, where Chris Henschel would found a piece of ochre with these beautiful little engravings on of 70 something thousand years ago, and that threw out this multi-regional hypothesis where they said humans <coughs> become cognitively modern in Europe and then migrate around and come back into Africa or whatever they did. So everyone now agrees that this all happened in Africa. But obviously, where in Africa, when and why? So, um, the South Cape is quite the candidate for this to, to have happened, especially because of this 
the suite of evidence coming out of the archaeological sites. Um, this is an example of that big moment that changed everyone's minds about where it all took place. This is from Longwell's cave. Um, subsequently, so many things have been found. This is one of so many examples, even now, as Dion has spoken about us, our rock stars. Um, we have anoglyphs, which are quite possibly, you know, we're being discreet and careful, but are quite possibly also a symbolic, non-verbal reference of humans and our dates. We published last year 90 to 140,000 years, but now we've got our dates back. It's closer to 140. So these anoglyphs, and there are three lines of evidence that show us that they most probably are human. It's closer to the 140. So that rock that, that rock that we as stars rescued is actually quite an important rock. My PhD student Charles Helm, he thinks it's the most important rock on the planet. Forget about the Rosetta Stone. <laughs> Anyways, so I'm going to move to the coast. I can speak for hours about all this archaeological evidence. I'm going to bring it in here and there when we talk about the coast. Um, <clears throat> but when you start looking at diet and natural resources, uh, you see that at some point in the past, humans start using the coast, specifically here at Pinnacle Point. It's our oldest evidence on planet Earth of humans, homo sapiens, um, starting to use the intertidal resources as a form of diet, of protein. And then um, there are these two theories about it. The first says it's a physiological response. So if you over a lengthy time eat, um, shellfish, obviously the omega 3s and 6 components um, have a big influence systematically on brain growth. Um, and that's a physical response. The other one says that if you have a predict productive and predictable, dependable resource, only then will your social complexity hike, hike up. And we still see that today. Uh, there's a lot of territoriality about resources today. Water, oil, whatever it may be. Um, so, all of them, therefore, assume that the self-cap intertidal should be productive and resilient. Otherwise, it's not going to have an effect if it's not a strong resource. So, if you don't get ongoing good cost-to-benefit ratios, you get a lot of calories for the amount of calories you spend. That's the kind of stuff I do. And I want to report on that, and then, as you saw in introductory, move on to other ideas. So, uh, to give you a picture, 164,000 years ago, oopsie, wrong point, 164,000 years ago, Pinnacle Point, Mossel Bay, first evidence of uh, the start of coastal adaptation of us. Then, further on into the present, you know, younger, uh, you still see that all the red stuff is clinical point, but interestingly, between 90 and 120 or so up there, you start seeing that all of the sites, all the important sites in the south and southeast Cape, um, have evidence of humans using the coast, but also specifically where they really figured out the coast. And 164,000 years ago at clinical point, they haven't figured out the coast yet. They're using it, and fortunately I'm into tidal zone, because I want to do a bit of biology. Um, it's very, very rigidly zoned. So you will they can have fiscalinous species and fiscalinous fatais who are near it. Metaphorical gas, PP13B, that's the stop for some base to plan yet. And then now here of the grave, and it's a full process. As all of them good, but I need to go and find from cognitive bewijstukke van ons species by al die sites. Okay? Maar die skulpkos is een belangrike component, want ons vraag is nou, is het vrij goed, maar hoe kom nou hier, in die sitekaap, in die ergens anders nie? Wat is die rede vir die cognitive revolusie wat plaasgevind het hier op ons kus, in die sitekaap? Een ding wat ons wel weet, wat ons nou die lere toekom, wat ek doen, ons het een baie diverse Uh, Neerschool marine ecosystem. 
Nee, waar is alle in een pisspeesvens en as ons nou kan stap op die klippe, dan sien ons, jo, die klomp schuld ons, nee. Maar jy moet het een waarde gee, een kalorie, een, een wins, precies wins, syver ekonomie, nie rantens sê het nie, kalorie, want ons van leer jy, hoeveel krij jy terug? Want eindelijk as jy die ochtend bakker word, en jy verlaar die huis, dan begin jy klaar uit wat eet, En, want jy wil om nog iemand stap toe neem, jy moet om jaag, jy moet om vang, jy moet om processeer, jy moet om terug huis toe dra, daar is alles die broekje kost is wat jy moet uittrek voor jy by jou netto wits aankom. So met ander woorde, jy wil in die groen eindig, anders gaan jy dood gaan van die honger. So as jy meer energie spandeer as wat jy, as wat jy krij, dan lyk jy nie goed nie. So hoe lyk jy sy kwaad in termen van die uh, cost to benefit ratios, return rates, um, so, there's the story about the monthly cycle in two slides. Um, so, at pinnacle point, you have, at 164,000 years ago, they're going for this stuff. Okay? That's when the moon, uh, the sun, the moon, and the earth aren't aligned. We call it a neat tide. Doi Okay? Okay? And it's all, this whole thing is a 28 day lunar cycle, two spring tides, two neat tides. Okay, and then seven days later, these oaks align, and you have a spring tide, exposing these species. And as you can see, these tidal zones are defined. That's your splash zone, your littorina zone, your upper to lower balanoid, but the honeypot is the cochlea zone. And every now and then, a little bit of the subtitle or infratitle gets exposed due to the April and September equinoxes. And very interesting, when you have a high pressure cell, weather, climate, say twist of it, um, each isobar about 1013, I don't want to get into this, but each isobar about 1013 is one centimeter lower than the predicted tidal level. So if you have a big swat say twist, high pressure cell in 1040, you can have a 27 centimeter lower tide than, than this described in the bookie. So this whole story here actually exposes itself way more than just April and September when you get big high pressure cells. Anyways, that's the story about the intertidal zone and how over time to the other sites they started figuring out the lunar cycle and they knew there's our cost to benefit ratio. When we go here, when the, when the moon's wrong, neat tides, we don't get lots of bang for our buck. But when we go when the moon's right, spring tides, new moon and full moon, that's an amazing story, which I'm going to explain to you now. So yeah, the actual lunar cycle quickly, uh, I had to do this, although we all live by the coast and I think you all get, a, get the leaps and the springs, but anyway, um, you have a neat tide, they're not aligned, very low tidal variation, doesn't get very low, doesn't get very high. Then seven days later they're aligned and you get a very good tidal variation, you get a nice low tide, exposing the cochlea zone that you can't do. And then seven days later another neat tide, non-aligned, seven days later there you go. So 28 day tidal cycle, lunar cycle. Um, between 90 110 <coughs> people have figured this out. They had it down. In other words, coastal adaptation is very, very obvious by 190, 80, whatever. Somewhere around there. So, they were fully coastally adapted by me. Okay. Just an idea, finally. That's your mean, uh, mean neat dive low. So, it's very bad. And that's your mean low tide at spring. And I just, this is just a simple bar plot, but these are just some samples that I did with the people in their foraging experiments that I did for my productivity with my PhD. So I went on various occasions with people. These are the tidal levels for those different occasions. So a nice spread of different good to bad tides from spring to neat. And then, I needed people to do this. And fortunately, um, I only went there for two days. Honestly, um, there's a huge coastal culture there. 
And there's Johnny Apples. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You can go and look on YouTube. Um, something stunning. You know, it's got a beautiful story about Johnny Apples. And these are his two sons, uh, Donovan and Henry. Which, they both live in, in North Africa. And through time, I basically used the North Africa people and the Khodrits people. Khodrits, Bitovil. Bitovil is right there by the coast. They're amazing for my work. Uh, they even use the Cape Rock Crab. Kaapse rooi krap, waar krap wat poorval op die klippe is. Ek gaan die Latijn uitkels vandag. Vir whooping cough. So, hulle tot medicijnes uit die see uit, nie net uit die plante uit nie. Bysje, hierdie mens het een lang kultuur van saam die kus leer. En daar is my gauwits van my gauwits mense. Ok. Op die volgende ding is die marine habitat types. Dis nie alles die selle op die kus nie. Daar is een beskrijfneid van soorte marine habitat types. Ek moes gaan kyk of daar verskil is in die productiviteit en betrouwbaarheid van die verskillende habitat types en hulle is. Jy krijg tafelberg sandsteen met table mountain group sandstones dominating this coast above the harbour, everywhere, big percentage, but it's subdivided in three categories, exposed rocky headlands, wave cut platforms, and boulders. And I tested all three, and then the next one, you get Aeolianite reefs. So this is where the rock stars went. 17 k's east of Stolbo from Creed School on um, is the Aeolianite patch, and Charles is, I know, mixing it up a bit, but anyways, it's fraught with trackways left behind by humans, animals, mammals, reptiles, and birds. On Wednesday, we found an extinct giant flamingo, for instance, on this coast. But the Aeolianite reefs, and then obviously you get some beach. And this is your uh, percentages of all of these in my study area that I looked at was exactly between Blombos Cave and Pinnacle Point. It was ground proofed by colleagues, and if you walk it, it's 100.8 kilometers. Um, so in this 100.8 kilometers between Pinnacle Point and Blombos, those are your percentages. And you can see that boulders, exposed rocky headlands and wave cut platforms, in other words, TMS, Table Mountain Sandstones, is the lion's share of this habitat, the, the broader marine habitat. Okay. Then, this is an example of one person, not the whole catch for the day, but just an example of the prey diversity. Uh, and you'll obviously know some of this stuff. I was allowed to do this, I had a research permit with that. Hence, so peace. Um, and whatever they wanted to take, they were allowed to take, there was a, a, a limit, but it was quite a big limit, but there was a hell of a lot of catch and release. Um, <coughs> then there's two species they also go for. Fresh red bait is not the story you know about Khalyun. Um, you know, everyone has this idea about red bait being the smelly hot thing. Eindelijk, wat hulle doen is, hulle vat een vars groen stok, en hulle haal die goed vars uit, en hulle maak een lekker kebab, en hulle draai hem op die veer. En baie mense het het rauw, soos oos. Maar in elk geval, rooi aas en seka is twee goed wat jy nie gaan optel in die archeologische rekord nie, want daar is niks wat preserveer nie. Die seka het sy berg, sy tanne, twee tanne, van een gaai berg, dit is shit team dit bou nie. Ok, aan die krekels is volop op ons kus. Voor ek nog gaan kyk het en ek kon sien in cyfers, dat is die aanname, aan die krekels is seker met een van die dinge wat hulle die meeste kry, want ons sien het in die archeologische rekel. Dit domineer die archeologische rekel en ook ons harvest composition wat ek toegekry het, wat is die presentaties jy gaan hulle sien? van die verskillende species wat vandag getarget word. Dit is stem baie mooi oor die en met die presentaties van die verskillende species wat ons sien in die vindplasse. So die mense van vandag in die opzicht was een goeie analoog om te gebruik. 
net vinnig aan die kruis om, um, ons het, ek het ook, was die kiepe kommer, dat ek gebruik, skroewe draaiers, en, um, betaal implemente, om die goed, om vir die goed te wei, en om het te proceseer. Toen ek kan nie vraag, um, as jy nou nie metaal gehad het, nie, want die mens het nie metaal gehad, toen jy die been uit of klip gehad, wat sy gebruik het, as jy nie metaal gehad het, nie, en allemaal, wat ek gevraag het, het gesê, hout of been, gesê, wat sy hout, uh, olien van die kus, lang na, olia, uh, europea, subspecie, afrikana, variasie, exasperata. Nee, nou wil nie, is ek raar. Maar wat allemaal deestal sê, olia, exasperata, en dankie tol vir dit. Nee, tol het al gesien, dat al verskil is tussen die swaar toe en die kus nie. Tol nie nou. Um, of bene, uh, groot wildspene. Toe gaan ek na kloofslaghuis, en die ouwe so naas, ek het hem al weer gevra onlangs met die M-student, hy geef my klomp bok binnen, koedoe of whatever, teemers en medische. Uh, ek het ook aangeneem dat die, dat die uh, bene gaaf so wees, want murg was baie belangrijk, vooral met groot bene, maar ons het het ook nou getoets, jy kan nie met rauw bene enig iets doen, dit is niks waar, met gaaf bene, as ook een collega met wits, wat nou kyk na die treatment van bene, om te sien, want bene is ook gebruik vir tools, vir lemmer, wat ook al, maar in elk geval, ons het toe gesê, ons het met die mense, hulle het gaan maak, hulle het gewaai met die goed, hout is beter as een skroebedraai, jy krij meer return reis, hoog kalorie vir hier, met die ding hout nou wat hulle maak, is amper soos een skroebedraai punt, en het lyk soos die digging sticks, wat hulle gebruik het vir bolle grau, het korter, baie effectief, so kon ek dus wees, die kalorie om die result, wat ek nou gaan bespreek, ehm, so, dit is een goeie analoog om te extrapoleer na die voorgeschiedenis, want ek het het selfs met hout en beer getoets, en hulle werk net so goed of beter. Maar kom ons kijk gaan nog na veranderlikes wat die return rates affecteer. So, weather conditions, big swell, flat summer's day, must have an effect on productivity, access to the coast, dangerous. So, what we do is we, ehm, Looked at the Beaufort scale over there, uh, which is a formal proxy for weather conditions, and then we made our own. So if it's a one, excellent conditions. Flat seas, no wind, lovely conditions. Um, if it's a four, they still go, but it's kind of becoming life threatening. And then a five, they don't even go. Okay? So this must have had an effect, and these were always noted with every day. And we also then used weather condition ratings as a predicted variable in our statistics to see, and we can clearly see, the better the conditions, the more calories the amount of the Anyways. Um, so how did I go about doing this? They're foraging experiments with indigenous people, uh, employing their knowledge where they want to go, and all of that, when they want to go, but I have to record it in a specific way with methods. So basically, they're foraging bouts, they go for half an hour, I get their stuff, I count and weigh each species. That's gross live weight. Then I do on my own allometric conversions, where you take a few of them, 20 or whatever, and you weigh, you weigh gross weight, you weigh edible por cooked edible portion, and therefore you know what they're getting in weight and count, we know how many calories they're getting. Okay. So these are foraging bouts. They'll have a half an hour, quickly get their stuff, and they just keep going until they're done. Okay, and so let's start with productivity results. If you don't mind, I've got a few figures. Get a paar grafieke. Maak so nou met die duidelik. Hier soos die harvest komposisie in die productivity van 50 laag getuie wat ek met hulle gegaan het, door van spring en dooi getuie. So met ander woorde, harvest komposition in kalorie, nie in hoeveel uit wat te kom. En so dat jy dit duidelik kan sê, 54% al die krekel, klomp suffies, mossels, dis nou die fancy naam en excies, al die krekel, turbo boosts en makkiekes. Suffies, al die oud is midday, as die perle moed was, nie? Hy sit op die ergens, maar baie min, hy sien as die klas uit, 1%. So, in termen van wat op die kus geskikbaar is, dis die type goed wat hulle krij in kalorie en hoeveelhede, van die verskillende goed. 
Nou, soos ek gesê, daar is verskillende marine habitat types, en Goli en Night Reefs, spore pus, noem ek het, um, is die beste. En het is juist by die feit, dat het gedomineer word door al die krekels. Daar is verskrik vir baie al die krekels in Goli en Night Reefs. So jy plik net drijwe, jy weet, um, so dit is een baie productieve specie, uh, wat ek ook nie. Dan, condition ratings, ek kan duidelik sien, excuse, ek kan nie die figure verduidelik nie, die vorige een ook, die IAS is kalorieën per uur, nee, wat jy krijg. Uh, die norm so half op die, in die wereld is, ek kan nie, Suid-Afrika is nogal hoog, gemiddelde kalorieën wat mense inneem in Suid-Afrika is meer as 4000, maar eindelijk moet het so rondom 2000 wees. Ek krijg so dagse benodigheden vir die mens, so 2000 is die nie nie nie. Want kijk, ons het ook verander van toe af, nie, ek denk, mense was meer effectief met hoe hulle die kalorieën verbruik het, fysies. So ek denk hulle, was het beter engines gehad, dan, net so iets. En dan, hierdie en sal is hier die kalorieën per hier, um, as, die, as die swel groot is, en is na waar buiten, baie min, baie goed. Okay. Dan, kom ons kyk na getuie. Ons het gesê dat getuie die grootste effect het op hoeveel kalorieën uit die see uitkom. Uh, jy hoef nie te waar nou al die dots goed nie, maar dit is daar al die tactiekes, nie? En, um, en hoe laag het is, hier is die getuie hoogte, daar is natuurlijk een spring laag getuie, 20 centimeter, kalorieën, en jy kan duidelijk sien, hoe hoor die getuie raak, hoe minne toegang het jy tot die kachlea op sy hou, en hoe swakker dank jou calorific return rates. Ok. Um, then, what I did is, I wanted to know how this relates to, how do these return rates in the Southern Cape relate to other places where, people, where we have this knowledge, the same calorific knowledge of people, and if you're a Hatsa, if you're a Hatsa in uh, Tanzania, and you're digging for tubers, for bulbs, prehistoric potatoes, um, it doesn't look all that great, because you're only going to get about 258 calories per hour. But if you, uh, uh, Kiribati, Micronesia, also going for shellfish, not all that great per hour. You know, did you spend 380 to get that 380? Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't look all that great. Then you just got to keep fighting. <laughs> um, but if you're in, um, this, and Betty Mia did amazing work, this is in 82, she showed in the, um, uh, it's the, the Arnhem Land, Aborigines in Northern Australia, she started showing that um, if you're in the right place, shellfish isn't necessarily a fallback option. It's actually a real option. As long as you know where to go and do it and where to do it. Uh, the assumption before Mia's work was that shellfish is an absolute fallback option. It's not something almost worth doing. It's only in diet times that you're going to start thinking about shellfish. And then the, um, you get the, the people in Paraguay, the Ache, um, also hunter-gatherers, but in the neotropics, those poor monkeys and those poor nine-banded armadillos, because they're getting, it's starting to look quite good when they hunt with bow and arrow. Okay? And then our, uh, my return rates were uh, the highest ever recorded on the planet at 1,459. <coughs> So never have we seen such a calorific rich return rate than on the South Cape coast. So yes, wow, it was, it's a productive thing. So if you have different foraging options, but you go to the coast on spring now, you're going to get some real return rates. Okay. Now just, it's not something we like doing, it's just showing a scenario that day. <coughs> so once again, calories. Okay, and the worst possible conditions, female, men, foraging return rates under best and worst combination of conditions compared to the male and female mean. You can also so obviously men get more because it's risky in the cochlear zone and uh, women are sometimes, you know, they've got kids to think about also and they don't want to get hurt. So men get more. And so, if you put this scenario down, and you look at all these variables that we looked at, if you're an old woman, 
Um, you need to table mountain sandstone boulders, which we saw was the worst marine habitat type. You have a con weather condition rating of 4, and you've got a high tidal level, it's not going to work out so well for you. You know, what is that? And, but, I see a young miner in an Aeolian night with a condition of one low tide level, done at the exit of the Urmlucker Heart, it's a lot of You have 10 to 12 days in the Kennedy Outlier, but for your 8 days plus, it's a bit of a Urmlucker Heart, but it's 8 to 10 days in Kalorie per year. But it's not only a half year. As you know, so kijk naar hier, is het dan zo? Zo als gemiddeld, maar die gemiddelde, maar als je die pot gaan roeren, was je vier, vijf, negen per tien. Oké. Resilience. Je kan dan van al vijf op die kus, maar hoe lang gaan het houden voor alles op is? Dus eindelijk die die gouden draak. Maar de vraag hier is, wie lang kan mijn verhouding van mensen in die ecosysteem? So I could plot it for you. Dion, say me that how you like my time. Dion, you take me to Hanford. Okay, but excuse me, I can only track for us. Other plots, 300 meter plots, as you can see. Other two in Aeolia night, and other two in Table Mountain Sandstone. Why did I do that? Because every two weeks there's a springtime, every month there's a springtime. So I had a plot, a two weekly plot in Aeolia night, and I had a two weekly plot in Table Mountain Sandstone, and then I had four weekly. So I had four plots, and I kept this up for 10, 11 months. Three strong, very knowledgeable men. Uh, basically, everything was released except where I needed to send stuff off nutrient analyses, elementary conversions. But we made sure to release at least a kilometer away because ASOL did his PhD in Tsitsikama long ago with UPE back then, uh, studying the biology of alien vehicles. And they're mobile species, which is something I'm going to get to now. Um, and they can migrate back into my plots, which I didn't want to happen because I wanted to test the depletion of these habitat types. I managed to keep it up for 10 months, and sorry for this figure, it's nasty, it's a rentagram. <laughs> Calories, um, how long did I do it? The four plots. But overall, what this said is that there wasn't really any depletion after 10 or 11 months. And um, now I think I'm going to get to drivers. Yes. Yeah. So that's now it's relevant to start talking about this. So why is the South Cape so productive and resilient to human predation? People keep hammering it, it just keeps coming back. Something's on the go. So that was an interesting question. So firstly, I'm just going to say I'm going to talk about major oceanic currents on the, you know, on our coast. Mobile versus sessile intertidal species. Sculptors but can loop, you know, sculptors but need loop. A sculptors but loop is a alikrekel, a sculptors but need loop is a mossel, by far. Then, I want to talk about slowly receding thermometries, which means underwater, on land we call it topography, the landscape. So if it's flat, we say it has no topography. But if it's all hilly and tekira gegaan, then there's a lot of topography. And um, what's happening underwater that's affecting these guys? Okay. Um, so the discussion of my results was around these things, and then yeah, I think that's quite important to talk about the reaction to predation, because there was a reaction. Okay. Um, firstly, you have the Galas current coming down the east coast of Africa. Then you have the Benguela current going up the west coast of Africa. The South Cape is the confluence. For six months of the year, it's a bit more Benguela. For six months of the year, it's a bit more Algaris. But you have your cauldron of confluence in the Southern Cape. So what that means is that if, the, um, if you're up here in Durbs somewhere, uh, you get a high diversity of species, but you get very low 
within species abundances. It's a lot of everything, but not a lot of each one. But if you go up the west coast, um, low species diversity, high within species abundances. And if you come to the south Cape, you get the best of both worlds. You get high diversity and high within species abundances. One, number one driver, currents. The gullus is nutrient poor, the big whale is nutrient rich. Um, but the two of them together, South Cape is quite a nugget. Also, we get upwelling systems. You get a southeast blowing. Uh, yesterday, the day before, the water went down to 10 degrees Celsius. The deep water comes up, bringing with it a lot of nutrition. Those things need to eat. Right? They, they need to have something in the water that feeds them, that feeds the algae, that feeds them. It's an ecosystem. Okay? Then, mobile versus sessile. Skulpkos wat kan loop tegen een skulpkos wat niet kan loop nie. So as jy dat gesien het, al die kreukels is een groot deel van die harvest composition, maar dit is omdat hulle kan loop. As die mense net skulpkos gehad het wat niet kan loop nie, dan krijg ek die kus jammer, met hulle gaan op parties. Want wat bijvoorbeeld met al die kreukels is dat um, 95% van die al die kreukel bevolking woon permanent onder water. En net 5% is in die kakglia en blauwe vallemoe. Maar allemaal wil in die 5% woon, dit is prime real estate, soos water kan staan. Dit is die kakglia, want die optimum sierstof, kotosynthese, hulle is koeie, hulle is so pasture, en die fijn alge, seegasies. Maar as jy die al die krekels uit die integriteit so in het wegvat, en jy gaan twee weke later terug, jy tweede keer met ons gebeur het, dan is dit dubbel en het was pristien voor die eerste keer. En dit beteken dat ze reactie um, hulle vind uit, en het moet een chemische antwoord, een chemische communicatie wees, ouwens, is, is, is probleme. Okay? En dan kom uit die subtitle, die diepte uit, waar 95% van die bevolking is, ja, ons, soek, ons wil al die prime regels strijk wees, maar na drie weke tot een maand, kom hy weer terug na carrying capacity. Met, soos het, as jy nou gaan, dan is dit die pristine, dat nie gevaar het in die koning. Uh, and we have quite a few mobile species. Pernal moon, sifi, little bit mobile sifis. Seka, lives down to 200 meters vertical depth, only lives a year, can be up to 4.5 kilograms at 290 days. You can look at this thing and it's growing. It's a very sustainable species. Potentially, you know. Although, shame, the thing is so intelligent and everything, but. <laughs> Cessile species don't move, therefore, the only defense they'll have is procreation. Spawn has to grow again. Um, interesting little anecdote, if I may. Um, if you look at um, growth rates, life cycles, sessile species that occur a lot in the archaeological record. Through time, as you've heard, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time for biology to react. 160,000 years. If you look at mussels, uh, goat's eye limpet, things like that, they only live two to three years long. So if you look at life cycles of sessile species that we know have been he heavily predated, interesting that their life cycle is so short. Then if you look at uh, the least preferred shellfish species that we see in the archaeological record and today like the cochlea limpet or the pear limpet, scooter lustra cochlea. Uh, it's right there in the front, the cochlea zone. It's hardly got any meat on it and it's very hard to get off the rocks. Um, it lives for 15 to 20 years. Interesting. So a co-evolution potential there. You know, with people and these animals have, have had a long relationship. So, mobility, and, and I call it the pantry hypothesis, uh, ongoing productiveness and resilience is due to the enormous pantry that sits up here because of the fact that you are very slowly receding the fimetries that sh stay shallow, far up. So, you have a big pantry um, which keeps letting them come out and offer more meat to the people who go for it. And there's a, a few examples of mobile species. Uh, Alicrekel, Sirkat, Sipi, Bermond. 
There's a few examples of central still stand species. Uh, all the limpets, uh, robots, whelks, and I would say a periwinkle is mobile, but geez, it's only like in a one or two meter area. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> what's next? So you see how I'm slowly receding the families plays into the sessile versus mobile due to the pantry hypothesis. Uh, also, you see the fact that Aeolianite reefs were the most productive and resilient because they have the slowest receding perfirmatories. Uh, Aeolianite is a very uniform density geology and therefore it erodes very uniformly. So on spring low tide, if you go to Gielkraan, so that's where it's all at, on spring low, you'll see vast reefs far out that are dry. And that also happens underwater. It's big areas of quite shallow, because if it drops down to 40 meters quickly, that's not going to be resilient, because those things don't live there, apart from the octopus. Okay, so reaction to predation. Um, I've also woven that in already, but um, the interesting thing that I just might say about it is that, um, firstly I said life cycles. The other one that, that I observed, which was so interesting, is that when I did my depletion studies on this coast, I heard back from a farmer's son a year or so after I finished it uh, because they knew what that coast was like before I started my depletion experiments. And they went to look for themselves a, a while after I finished. And it was uh, absolutely thriving after my 10, 11 months of hurting this intertidal. I didn't hurt it, I was pruning the bush. I was stimulating uh, uh, a reaction because of this ongoing predation. I also compare it to bee farming. If you take honey, they make honey, you know? Okay, so uh, that's my sculptor story, okay? And I want to just talk about two more things. <coughs> the, the first is sticking to this area that you guys all live in. Uh, what else is going on? You know, we can't just look at that coastal adaptation story. So, what are the other whys? Why did it happen here and not somewhere else uh, in this ecosystem of which humans were a part of? Well, there's a hell of a lot going on in terms of vegetation. We've done so many studies, I'm not going to talk about it now. It's someone else, some other day. Um, but there's all the, the ethnobotany. Uh, when I did that, it was extremely impressive what the people still know and do with plants. Um, today, they still effectively eat 58 species with 69 uses around here. Uh, out of fables, berries, bulbs, leaves, whatever. And their medicinal knowledge is incredible, uh, beautiful. Um, you have a, not today anymore, but you have a lot of game. Especially, and this is once again Charles Helm, we heard about him, rock stars. Uh, we get the body fossil record. Those are the bones that preserve in, in archaeological sites, hyena dens, stuff like that. The bones, body fossil record. Unfortunately, it's things like the Schlepp effect, as I've been speaking about cost to benefit ratios, optimal foraging theory. A lot of that stuff comes home as meat. Some species aren't even hunted for. And this project with Charles Howell has shown us so many new species. Uh, we got giraffe here. We never knew giraffe was here. Uh, a lot of extinct stuff. Uh, we just published last week on an extinct giant tortoise that I found with a carapace length of more than a meter. So there were these huge tortoises here. Uh, and the list goes on. Okay? But why? Most of the period that these tracks were made is during the late Pleistocene, where various exposures of the Gallus back were, were evident. So, when you have an ice age, you have seriously receding sea levels because there's so much ice in the poles, and the sea is about 90 k's away from Stolba, and you can see by a Gallus, no, it's probably there, we're more than 90 now, I don't know. Well, let's call it 165 by a Gallus like that. That plane in its most 
in a glacial maximum in its furthest extent. It's now underwater. Was that thing, and it's been exposed for way more than half of the relevant past. It's hard to imagine when you look south, but actually, what we see now is a short blip of the past. Um, and what we also realize that, that everything's holding on now, that they're thriving during the Ice Age on the Paleogallus Plain. And we've also found that there was a vast migratory system. Um, Western West Cape rainfall in winter, East Cape rainfall in summer, bimodal rainfall in the South Cape. Um, so in terms of land, terrestrial resources, we've also made a lot of, we've done a lot of work. We published in 2020, 22 papers in a special edition of Quaternary Science Reviews, all the secrets about this Paleogallus plain. 80,000 square kilometers gets added onto our Characteristic region. Um, uh, Richard Cowling and Adrian Grobler are looking at the effect of these transgressions and regressions on the evolution of fungus. <coughs> Endemism in older calcareous alkaline soils. They've made a hell of a lot of, uh, of, of progress. We had Medicos conference recently in Langebaan. Extremely impressive. You can go look for it on, on YouTube. It's, it's on YouTube. Medicos, Back 5, we had a whole symposium. And you can hear Richard and Adrian talk about the effect of ice ages and Paleogallus plain on how plants became the way they are. Coastal plants. You know, not the older geologies further, further inland, but the geologies that have been adjacent to this, what's going down here. One interesting thing I found was that you get a plant species over here. And then you don't get it, but it's somewhere over there today, right? What's this weird distribution? And that's a signal of how uh, they freely roam on the plane, but today they're just sitting in isolation. Another example is certain uh, fauna, boca, like you prefer, went extinct in the last 12, 11,000 years. This is the warm period when the coast is where it's now. Um, <clears throat> those big things that we find with Charles' tracks, they also all went extinct when the ice age ended. So, a big component of the story today about why here is this plain. Uh, and then finally back to coastal adaptation, this plain is mostly comprised of Aeolianite, which means uh, the intertidal zone in an ice age is mostly Aeolianite, and therefore the return rates I got for shellfish would have been higher during glacial periods. And then finally, I don't even have slides, you've seen enough slides. But I'm working in the Eastern Cape in Ponderland. At first when I went there, um, I got a postdoc there doing the terrestrial stuff on plants and stuff. Um, at first I thought, no ways, I've got to test this because it's only a gallus. There's no penguin. Um, and, but I wasn't expecting much to go on there, you know. Low productivity and resilience. I was very surprised. And the reason therefore is the ongoing productivity for humans there, and resilience, because they keep going, uh, and also in a good area of Ponderland, is that you have the drop-off, the gutter's plane, drops off 5 k's away. Not that many far. And um, when you get a, a cross short wind, which I think they, they dominating one is a northeaster, you get very sudden and very radical upwelling events, bringing that nutrition up, feeding that near shore marine ecosystem. But the most interesting thing is the, that area has extreme topography. You know, if you want to go 20 k's, it's going to take you a few hours around. You might as well just walk it. Um, but you have all of these rivers, and a little bit of rain sends off lots of fresh water into this near shore marine ecosystem. And I've got pictures of that. After a bit of rain, there's this brown strip down the coast. And I have colleagues um, who've looked at this, you know, the freshwater nutrition into the marine uh, ecosystem is quite impressive. And therefore, there's another engine feeding that system so that it's ongoing productivity and resilience. The North Cape, as I said, is extremely interesting. Uh, George Branch even suggested a, a limpet farm, farmery or, you know, uh, set up there. 
um, the, the Namaqua coast up higher than West Cape, North Cape, has an unprecedented upwelling system from the Minguela. So, very, very dense, nutritious water. But it's a very narrow zone, um, and there's not a lot of mobility. But if you're on those beaches, you can't even call them beaches, they're shell beaches. It's just the turnover of these sessile species is incredible. Their life cycles are very short. And um, I've just done a bit of work there, just kind of kicking off. Uh, but I looked at the elementary conversion of the two limpet species I found the most in the middens and stuff up there. And I cooked them, raw weights, measures, whatever, cooked weights. But their uh, caviar is 50% of the edible weight of the meat. And here it's a few percent. So, you know, they're kicking out babies, eh? like you can't see the meat. And the caviar, what you call the goat man, um, is uh, the most nutritious, fatty component, and it's very, very tasty, actually. On the smear it of a toasty, it's delicious. Um, anyways, 